my name is Ben Levine, and I'm from the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center at Dallas. So I'm a cardiologist and cardiovascular physiologist, and my global interest is to study the adaptive capacity of the heart and circulation. How does the body respond to exercise training or detraining, like bed rest or space flight? And how does that imply what happens to the body with aging or uh, um, other diseases of the cardiovascular system? My research also focuses on the limits to human performance in health and disease. And I got into I got into the research business initially by studying what happens to astronauts. Um, astronauts, as you, you may or may not know, when they go into space, they lose the ability to adapt to gravity. And um, so when they come back down to Earth, about two-thirds of them faint. And understanding why that is, what happens to the body in space, led me to do some studies um, to simulate microgravity on Earth. And how do you do that? Well, you put someone to bed. So when you put someone to bed, the heart atrophies, shrinks, and the body has a deconditioning response. So that led us to ask, well, how might we overcome or prevent that? And so we did some long-term training studies. And uh, so we, that led us into, well, what about long-duration exercise or long-duration space flight? And so that, that's, I think, where the majority of the work got done. The Olympics serves as a great focus for people's attention on human performance. And um, the one of the other hats that I wear is in altitude training. So um, actually, after I leave here, I'm going to Scotland to talk to the Scotland Institute of Sport to talk to them about uh, athletic performance and altitude training. So um, the Olympics really focus our attention on human performance of all types. Really, the athletes are at the very pinnacle of human performance. And if you can understand what pushes that limit, what allows someone to run a mile under four minutes or a two-hour marathon, what's interesting is that you can then extrapolate that to what might limit people who are naturally limited and not Olympic athletes. For example, the same thing that may limit a competitive athlete might also limit a patient with heart failure from being able just to walk up and down the street or an elderly person to being able to make a bed. So it's the same limitations, and it really does bring the physiology into sharper focus. What is the most demanding sport? Well, I guess you'd have to ask every athlete who comes to London in July, and each one of them would say it was theirs, right? So I was a competitive wrestler when I was in uh, college, so of course wrestling must be the most demanding. But I'm not sure that it's a fair question. Each sport at the elite level requires an extraordinary level of commitment and physical performance. So, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the kinds of athletes we're very interested in is rowers, because rowers have the biggest, thickest hearts of any athletes. They also have the densest bones, by the way. And rowing is a very interesting sport. Each time you pull on the oars, your blood pressure goes way up. And that uh, you use a large amount of muscle mass, and that tends to stimulate a big heart growth. And because of that, we actually applied rowing as a countermeasure to long duration space flight. So we tried, while people were in bed, we had them row, and we completely prevented the deconditioning associated with bed rest. And then we applied it to a special patient population, young women with the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, basically who have what looks like the inability to deal with gravity. They can't stand up either. And when we make them row, their symptoms get better as well. So I'm especially interested in rowing. Of course, that doesn't mean that all endurance sports aren't interesting or challenging, and they all are. Science doesn't tend to advance in radical sea changes. It, frankly, most of science is incremental. And so um, I think that if you asked me to choose what might be the next great leap of understanding leading to major leaps in performance, it might be how to manipulate, um, identify and manipulate the, 
the very basic molecular adaptations to exercise training in the heart, in the skeletal muscle, to perhaps augment the natural training responses. I think we're away a ways from that. I think the models that we have right now are, are pretty gross and crude. But five year, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, might we really have tools that could turn on or off some of the biological adaptations or enhance them? Uh, yeah, it's possible. If, my, if I were an Olympian, I would love for it to be in, uh, in competitive wrestling. I'm afraid that my time has passed, though. I'll tell you one other thing, though. I'd really love to be a pole vaulter. You know, it certainly looks like so much fun to run up and then to flip over the bar, but it's also beyond me. I think, th let me turn your question around a little bit when you ask about what a are there fixed limits to what humans could ever achieve? And you asked the question about running the 100 meters. Well, I can tell you this. You'll no, no human will ever run the 100 meters in two seconds. So we know that for sure. So what are the things that limit that? And there, you have to understand the nature of each sport, the biomechanics, the power output, the specifics of the individual competition. For me, I'm, most of my expertise is in endurance sport, and we've been arguing within the field about whether you can ever run a marathon in under two hours. I and mean, that's perhaps a different challenge, but an interesting one. What does your heart have to be like? What does your skeletal muscle have to be like? What kind of nutrition and power outputs do you need to generate? How do you avoid the injuries to do the kind of training to get to that level? Um, you know, we know, for example, that you can run 100 meters in 10 seconds. But you certainly can't run that speed for 26.2 miles. So why is that? You know, what are those things that limit it? It's energy utilization. It's not the fact that we're not motivated enough to run that fast that long. But that's simply a limitation of energy production in your skeletal muscle at those speeds. So you have to understand where those things cross over to answer the question about each individual sport.